Hi, thanks for checking out this recording. My name is Tristan Goetz, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow of Embedded Ethics at Harvard University, where we design ethics lessons for computer science courses. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm going to be talking to you about the responsibility gap uh, with regard to computer systems, particularly when it comes to autonomous systems, but uh, the issue is a perennial one in computer ethics uh, about just who is responsible and what can we demand of the different parties involved when a computer system causes harm. So here's sort of the context which occasions uh, my interest in this subject, uh, which is that there's been a lot of hype about autonomous systems, artificial intelligence, machine learning, however you want to describe it over the last few years, but there's this vacillation between praise and anticipation for all the different ways in which it could make our lives better, and scandal about all the ways in which it's making li our lives worse or at least more complicated. And uh, all of this discussion, I think, is complicated by the fact that it's not really clear who is morally responsible for the harms or the goods that are produced by these systems. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. First, I'm going to lay out a definition of moral responsibility as it's typically conceived and how that generates a gap with regard to who is responsible for what these systems do. I'm going to mention a few different previous attempts at solving this problem. Uh, I won't discuss them in depth, but there's much more on that in the paper. Uh, and then I'm going to present my positive proposal, which is to use this idea of vicarious responsibility and what I call moral entanglement to help us understand what the distinctive duties of computing professionals are uh, in these kinds of circumstances. So here's a standard account of moral responsibility from analytic moral philosophy. This is not associated with any particular uh, philosopher. It's just a very common way of uh, schematizing this. So the thought is, or the theory is, for some agent, we'll call them A, and for some event, we'll call it X. A is responsible for X only if A caused X, A was in control of whether or not X happened, and A knew or should have known that X would or might result from their actions. Now there's a lot of debate about exactly how to cash out each of these conditions. We're just going to set that aside for the most part today. What matters is that uh, this is sort of the received view of moral responsibility. And this is about the conditions under which someone's agency is uh, more connected to the action in a significant way such that they are uh, subject to moral evaluation. So if they did something good and they meet these conditions, then they're praiseworthy for it. If they did something bad and they meet these conditions, then they're blameworthy for it. And there are all kinds of things that we do all the time that we're morally responsible for, but that are neutral with regard to uh, whether it was morally good or bad. And this is more than just an intellectual category, I should say. Uh, this is uh, more than just some uh, grade on your moral ledger that goes up and down, uh, because these conditions also determine how we respond to the way people behave whether we can punish them for doing something wrong or criticize them or uh, get angry with them, or on the, other, on the flip side, whether or not we can offer them accolades or congratulations for doing something good. So this has practical effects. This is not just some uh, 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 philosophical stamp collecting. The responsibility gap occurs when we try to take this account of responsibility, again, however it's cashed out, and apply it to the case of uh, autonomous systems in particular, but computer systems in general, whenever they're taking action or making decisions instead of human beings. This is a particularly important problem right now because computers are increasingly making those decisions and taking action instead of people, especially as machine learning becomes more sophisticated and works its way into lots of different domains. Even though this means that computers are often the cause of morally significant events, whether it's a drone strike or a uh, financial application for a loan or something, or a decision about where to send medical resources, uh, they're not the sort of thing that we can hold morally responsible. They don't meet, while, while they meet the causal condition, 
they're the cause of these significant events, they can't meet the control or epistemic conditions. Why? Since they seem to be in control of something and they seem to have information about something? Well, it's because they don't have the right sort of mind. They don't have a mind at all, really. Um, they don't have the capacity to understand what they're doing or why it might be right or wrong, and they don't have desires and other aspects of agency that would make them a moral agent who we could hold morally responsible. So blaming the computer's out. But could we trace it back to some specific human beings, the developers or the people in charge of deploying it? Well, maybe. We could just say someone is responsible, but this is controversial and difficult because the causal responsibility is distributed across large teams and organizations. Uh, human control is distant and indirect, especially when we're dealing with things like deep learning, where it's kind of hard to say exactly what's going to come out of the black box at the end. And for the same reason, it's hard to predict how the system might behave sometimes. And so it's not clear who, if anyone, is responsible for the harms caused by a computer system, particularly an autonomous system, but not just those. Uh, and the corollary is that the same is true of good that's caused by a computer system, because again, those conditions are the same. It's just about how we evaluate the result. So if we are in a position of a responsibility gap with regard to harms caused by computer systems, we're in the same problem uh, when it comes to good that's produced and no one can accept praise or blame legitimately. I'm just going to mention four uh, types of previous solution. I won't discuss them in this recording. There's basically four uh, approaches that have been suggested. One is to implement some kind of legal framework. Santoro and colleagues suggest strict liability for this. Uh, another suggestion is that we could use a different philosophical account of moral responsibility, maybe one that drops the control condition, like Angela Smith's account. Or we could uh, do a retake of whether or not we could actually blame the computer. Maybe uh, we could legitimate the feelings of blame we already have towards these objects, or we could uh, implement some kind of machine ethics so computers actually understand what's right and wrong. Uh, for various reasons, I don't think any of those three are going to work out for this case, and you can read more about that in the proceedings. Uh, the fourth set, these professional ethics suggestions that we should enforce compliance with these professional ethical codes, like the ACM code. I think that's on the right track, but the accounts that Goderbar and Johnson, Ladd, Miller, and Nissenbaum offer just kind of assert that because computing professionals are professionals, they have certain duties. And they don't really explain why this bridges the responsibility gap in particular with regard to the developers of these systems. So I think we're still missing some kind of explanation for why a professional ethics approach is the right one. Uh, so I'm going to offer something like that. But it goes beyond the professional ethics context as well. Uh, so here's some background on this. This comes out of a paper I previously published in a philosophy journal. Uh, the idea is we can use this notion of vicarious responsibility, which is different from the personal sense of responsibility that I defined earlier. The idea here is that you're responsible for the behavior of someone or something else, and it's in a way that's different from uh, those that threefold set of conditions. So examples of this kind of case are uh, you have a child that hurts someone, or uh, your adult offspring commits a violent crime, or your country causes harm to another country, or uh, when it comes to good things, maybe it's something like your pet dog heroically saves someone from an animal attack. In each of these cases, we act almost like we're personally responsible for uh, what someone else or something else did. So I might apologize on behalf of my country, or I might apologize on behalf of my child. Um, I might offer to try to make things right after my child hurts someone, or I might uh, engage in, a, in activism in a particular sort of way as a citizen of a country that's done something wrong. Or I might accept some kind of congratulations for the actions of my heroic pet, um, now, in each of these kinds of cases, 
uh, we are not, I think, accepting blame or praise, right? We're not saying we are personally responsible for what's happened. Instead, we're somehow closely connected to what's happened, and so that means that we have moral reasons to respond in a distinctive way. Maybe there are distinctive duties that we have to fulfill when we're in these kinds of situations. So what explains this? These are very common events, even though they're not very well theorized in the philosophical literature. Are they all just disparate cases? Are we confused? Or is there something that unites them? Well, I think that there is something that unites them, and it's this. These are cases where the scope of our personal responsibility is uncertain, or it's vague. Why? Because our identity or our own agency has fuzzy boundaries and we're somehow connected to these other entities that are taking action in the world. The scope of our own influence over them might not be clear, or uh, by virtue of the role that we occupy, be it a parent or a citizen or something like that, uh, that makes that part of our identity morally salient when the other entity takes some action. And so these are what generate these moral reasons to take responsibility for the behavior of these other things in a way that's different from how a bystander might have moral reason to take action. So if a child causes some harm, a bystander maybe could blame the child or maybe uh, could step in and offer to help in some way, but we would expect the parents to engage at some uh, more sophisticated level. Uh, we wouldn't expect a bystander, for example, to apologize for what a child has done that they have no connection to, whereas we would expect a parent to offer such an apology. In general, these kinds of cases have this feature that I call moral entanglement, where the, our agency or our identity becomes mixed up with something else and the way that it behaves, such that we have a duty to uh, take responsibility for what the other entity has done in some distinctive kind of way. So what does this mean for computing professionals? Well, the thought is, computing professionals are morally entangled with the systems they develop. And this is for a couple of reasons. One is that, as Deborah Johnson argues, uh, the computing professional's agency is mixed in with uh, what she calls intentionality that's embedded in the system, ways in which the system is poised to respond to certain kinds of inputs. They're also entangled by virtue of their professional roles. An aspect of their identity generates moral reasons to respond to the behavior of the systems they've developed in a distinctive way. So because of these two features, I think that they have this, these moral reasons to take responsibility for how their systems behave because they have this vicarious responsibility. Now, how should they do that? Well, it's gonna depend on the case, but some of the things they might do are apologize for the harms that the system caused, or if the system did some good, accept some accolade for that, even though they personally didn't do anything uh, uh, directly to make it happen. Or they might take action to prevent the harm from occurring again, or change design procedures, or advocate against similar uses of the system. And of course, others might also be vicariously responsible if there are corporate leaders, for example, who are really pushing for making irresponsible choices. That's all. Here are some links. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. Uh, and I look forward to any further discussion. Thank you.